On July 17, 1944, Erwin Rommel's car was strafed by British aircraft after leaving his headquarters. The field marshal was seriously wounded and hospitalized with severe head injuries that took him out of World War II. The Normandy landings had taken place just a month before, and the British had suspected that Germany had mined the beaches of northern France, a devastating ploy that could foil their landing efforts. Thus, British Army officer George Lane was sent to gather intelligence. Lane was captured after having completed two successful missions. He expected to be executed according to Hitler's commando order, but instead he was blindfolded and taken to a secret location where he met Rommel face to face. The clever Jewish soldier managed to charm the desert fox and hide the fact that he was German and Jewish, and he was then sent to a prisoner camp. While there, Lane shared Rommel's location with the other inmates, and after confirming the specific chateau through a book in the camp's library, they relayed the information to London via a smuggled wireless radio. Rommel would be intercepted by British aircraft weeks later, one of many extraordinary accomplishments carried out with the help of German-Jewish operatives of the legendary X Troop, whose brave actions would significantly shape the fate of the war. untrustworthy. As Hitler rose to power and thousands of Jews fled their homes in Austria, Germany, and Eastern Europe, many of them made their way to the British Isles, where they hoped to build a new life, but also wait for the opportunity to fight back against their Nazi oppressors. Yet despite their eagerness to help oppose the Third Reich, German Jews in Britain were often treated with disdain and dubiousness, as they were always suspected of being possible Nazi spies. In one of the darkest chapters in British modern history, collective hysteria and fear led the UK to implement a policy that sent German refugees to prisoner camps. Colonel Henry Burton, a conservative member for Sudbury in the House of Commons, summarized the feeling of many Britons when he asked Parliament if it would not be, quote, far better to intern all the lot and then pick out the good ones. The term fifth column became ubiquitous in British society, describing the idea that German refugees could actively be working from inside the UK to undermine it. A Daily Mail article of the time blared, quote, All refugees should be drafted without delay to a remote part of the country and kept under strict supervision. You fail to realize that every German is an agent. This distorted notion led many traumatized Holocaust survivors out of Germany and into brutal internment camps all across the British Isles and the Commonwealth territories, where they endured forced labor, discrimination, and malnourishment. However, after the sudden attack on Pearl Harbor, the British government reversed the policy, and most of the German Jewish prisoners were finally freed. A significant number of them immediately enlisted in the British armed forces, practically begging for an opportunity to fight against the Nazis. Yet again, the German Jews were deemed untrustworthy to join the battlefront and be given weapons. Instead, they were sent to the Pioneer Corps, a rejected unit assigned to manual labor where most of the servicemen were not even armed. Still, those serving under the Pioneer Corps wrote many letters to their superiors, relaying how they were eager to fight the Nazis and help their families and friends. After thousands of letters, the British High Command finally decided that they could actually use a unit of highly skilled German-speaking commandos. Hence, they picked the best and brightest and established the X Troop. X Troop. In 1940, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill established the Number 10 Commando, a group of subunits recruited mainly from non-British personnel from German-occupied Europe. As Churchill put it, these forces' objective was to, quote, develop a reign of terror down the enemy coast. Several French, Dutch, and Belgian subunits, also called troops, were formed, but the most unique would be the X Troop, made almost exclusively of enemy aliens or German nationals. The majority of ex-troop members were Jewish, and most were hand-selected by Captain Byron Hilton Jones in 1942 amid thousands of eager recruits. Only the best, the most skilled, and the ones most proficient in English were considered. Many of the recruits were taken from the Pioneer Corps and sent to London, where they underwent strenuous evaluation by MI5 and rigorous training in combat, counterintelligence, and interrogation. 
All members of X-Troop adopted British names and false identities. For the remainder of their military service, they had to pretend to be native British soldiers. The X-Troopers had to completely embrace their false identities and even fabricate complex backstories to explain their particular accents, like claiming that they were raised by a German nanny or studied abroad. A total of 130 men served in X-Troop, but they never fought as a complete unit. Instead, they provided valuable service to other formations as interpreters, interrogators, or counterintelligence agents. D-Day. The group's members were some of the most dedicated and fiercest fighters of the war. For them, it was not just a matter of defending their homeland from a possible invasion, but many of their family members were in concentration camps. Ex-trooper Peter Masters later recalled that the war felt deeply personal for the men of his unit. Quote, you were praying for war, not because you were bloodthirsty, but because if you didn't fight, then you and all those you loved would be killed. Often anxious to be sent to the front line, the ex-trooper's determination was described as such by one of their members. Quote, Where some soldiers were drawing straws to see who got to stay back from the most dangerous missions, the ex-troops were drawing straws to see who got to do the most dangerous missions. Many of the ex-troop members even took a leading role during D-Day in 1944, with some of them serving in the iconic Bicycle Corps, where they landed carrying a bicycle to the rush enemy positions before anyone else to secure bunkers and machine gun nests. Peter Masters descended from the landing craft on the first day of the invasion at Sword Beach, unfolded his collapsible bicycle, and dashed across the battlefield to secure his objective. His regiment was the first one to cross the highly contested Pegasus Bridge, and ensure no German reinforcements were able to flank the British troops on Sword Beach. In total, 43 ex-troopers were placed with eight commando units during D-Day. Before the invasion, Brigadier Simon Fraser, also known as Lord Lovett, the legendary Scottish soldier who landed on Normandy to the music of Scottish bagpipes and fought the Nazis in hand-to-hand -hand combat, rallied the ex-troop members by saying, quote, You will shortly be embarking on ships for the invasion of France. You are the tip of the spear, the fine cutting edge of the British Expeditionary Force. You men should expect a physical encounter in which you had no equal. You know your job, and I know that you will not fail. Remember, the bigger the challenge, the better we play. History will tell that in our age there were giants who walked the earth, and by God, we're going to prove that tomorrow. Masters would later save Lord Lovett's life when the Scottish warrior was hit by shrapnel and the ex-trooper took him to safety. Manfred Gantz was one of the first ex-troopers to land on the German-fortified beaches on D-Day. Half of his unit was obliterated almost instantly, but he managed to overwhelm an enemy position and capture 25 Nazis. He then demanded they show him where the mines were located at the beachhead so the rest of his men could safely cross the beach. He would save innumerable lives that day. Back to Germany. As the war progressed and ex-troopers moved closer to Germany, they continued to show formidable bravery and remarkable determination and skills. And many of the ex-troops' astonishing accomplishments involved using their knowledge of the German language and culture to influence enemy behavior and gather crucial intelligence. As he entered war-torn Germany, Corporal Ian Harris wondered if he was shooting at any of his old schoolmates, but like many other Jewish boys of the time, he had to endure relentless abuse from his Nazi-indoctrinated schoolmates for being Jewish. After a successful encounter, Harris persuaded the commanding officer of an SS battalion in Osnabrück to surrender his entire position without a shot being fired. Ex-troopers were also known to interrogate German prisoners on the spot, and such intelligence would be used to make urgent and immediate decisions that often led to massive victories. In one instance, Peter Masters forced two German intelligence officers to reveal the location of German positions on the outskirts of Basel, thus allowing the British to eventually secure the Rhine crossing. Crossing the Rhine was a devastating blow for the already depleted German forces, and Joseph Goebbels would say, quote, The situation in the West has entered an extraordinarily critical, ostensibly almost deadly phase. Ex-troopers were seldom left in the same unit throughout the war, as Allied authorities usually moved them from one command to the next to better utilize their skills. One day, during an enemy confrontation, Masters was sent ahead of the other men to draw the enemy fire. He was the new guy with the accent, and thus the obvious choice. 
but as he approached the enemy position, he came up with a wild idea. As he remembered the movie Gunga Din, he imitated one of the fictional characters and started yelling in German, ordering the enemy to surrender because they were completely surrounded. The Germans were shocked to hear a native German voice giving them orders. They then hesitated, and instead of firing, they came out to see what was happening. The Allies then took advantage of the situation and stormed the enemy position, forcing them to surrender without losing a single life. Finding Their Families As the war drew to a close, many ex-troop members prioritized reaching their family members to save them from the cornered Nazis. After learning that his parents were in Theresienstadt concentration camp in Czechoslovakia, Manfred Gantz got permission to drive a jeep and make the long trip from the western to the eastern front. When he made it to Czechoslovakia, Soviet soldiers couldn't believe a British soldier was on the eastern front all by himself. Still, Gantz arrived at Theresienstadt just as the Soviets were about to liberate the camp, and as he ran inside the camp, he asked anyone in his path if they knew his parents. A woman then guided him to a building where he finally found them. He would later recall, quote, I suddenly find myself in their arms. They're both crying wildly. It sounds like the crying of despair. I look at father, and despite having prepared myself for a lot, I have to bite my teeth together not to show my shock. He is hardly recognizable, completely starved and wrecked. Ex-troop member Colin Anson had a similar experience. He was assigned to work in the Field Intelligence Agency Technical in Frankfurt, gathering intelligence on German technological advancements for post-war purposes but he also used his time in Frankfurt to find his mother, who had been left behind in the city after his father didn't survive the Dachau camp. Another member, Fred Jackson, was tasked with interrogating Nazi war criminal Rudolf Haas, the commander of the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp, where his mother had perished. After questioning Haas, Jackson was a broken man. Quote, I got drunk for a week. I just could not live with myself. From escaping the horrors of the Holocaust to being ostracized in Britain, storming the beaches of Normandy, and finally freeing their families in Germany, the ex-troops became an incredible example of courage and determination. After the war, most of them kept their British names for the rest of their lives. Thank you for watching our video. What do you think of the infamous ex-troop? Please let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss a single Dark Docs video. Also, if you want more exciting history-inspired content, check out our other Dark Documentaries channels, and stay tuned.